as I always say at the end of my videos, I love comments and I always answer them. You know, the thing is I get ideas for new videos and ideas in terms of running my own campaign. So recently a longtime viewer of my channel, Joel Anderson, left a comment in which he said, you know, he has always struggles with get, creating storylines for the creatures, uh, you know, and the scenarios and encounters that he has with his players. Too often it turns into, uh, you know, there's X number of Y creature, you know, they're this far away, roll for initiative. But the thing is, anything in the world that you create has a reason for being where they are. They have objectives and goals in terms of where they're going. You know, and if the players have some relationship, you know, either directly or even tangentially to the goals and motivations of the creatures they encounter, it makes your campaign more exciting and compelling. So, of course, helping Joel and you, the viewer, think about ways to do this is the sort of task that I live for. So I thought, okay, I am going to create some sample storylines for creatures in the Monster Manual that sort of epitomize my homebrewed approach to, you know, world building and gameplay. I knew that I needed an iconic creature that, you know, could handle the breadth and complexity of storytelling options. You know, creatures such as dragons or mind flayers, the classic beholders came to mind. But then I thought, you know, those monsters have been covered a million times. And, you know, some of the storylines with them, with their power and their history and whatnot, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious. I realized I needed to think outside the box and find a creature in the Monster Manual that would truly test, you know, my abilities to come up with compelling storylines, think about how the game is going to work, think about running a campaign. This would be a creature whose seeming simplicity you know, lends itself kind of impervious to clever storytelling, but in fact could create an interesting encounter or series of encounters for players. And something began to take shape in the dark recesses of this mind. A color-shifting, translucent blob, blinking eyes held on eye stalks, surrounded by an array of tentacles and a stench so foul I almost choked. Then I heard that strange noise it made through its form of travel, created by the gruesome puffs of gas that emanated from its nether regions. It was that noise that told the tale of the gruesome and much-mocked creature, the Flumph. Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own campaign. So we all know the jokes and memes that have sprung up about the Flumph, uh, which arise from the fact, you know, that it seems like a silly monster that never attacks the player. You know, and you might ask yourself, why was the Flumph, you know, even created as a monster? You know, and the answer, of course, like many things in D&D, the Flumph is a legacy creature. Uh, it was first introduced in this book, The Fiend Folio. Uh, from 1981. I bought this in 1981. You know, and this book was criticized at the time as a really inconsistent collection of homebrewed monsters that had been published in D&D magazines like White Dwarf. You know, the thing is, I played with almost all of these monsters in the 1980s, and I had a lot of fun with them. You know, this book actually introduced a ton of iconic uh, monsters to D&D. You've got the, you know, the Githyanki on the cover here, the Drow Elves, the Aracocra, Revenants, the Kuatoa, and the Kenku. But you know, it did have some clinkers like the Flail Snail, the Throat Leech, and the Enveloper, and the dreaded Protein Polymorph. You know, and the Flumph was often uh, lumped into this latter group as a underpowered kind of silly creature. So as such, it disappeared from the third and fourth edition monster manuals. It did sort of come about, you know, in some modules in magazines, but always as kind of a gag creature. And in fact, in those later things, they nerfed it, which is, you know, really saying something for a creature is inherently weak as the flump. So then the flump reappears in the fifth edition monster manual. And, you know, you look at its stats and you can see why players and GMs alike find them so boring. You know, first off, since they're defined as lawful good and most you know, player character parties tend towards good, they end up just, you know, floating up to the players and warning them, oh, there's psionic creatures that way, and then floating away. You know, and then if you do get into a fight with them, they're super weak. Even though the flumps are drawn with, you know, multiple tentacles, they only get one tentacle attack per turn, 
and it's 1d4 plus 2. It does have an extra acid uh, attack on that 1d4 that can last multiple turns, except it's a DC 10. Players are probably going to make the save. Now, it doesn't say so, but I assume maybe with the multiple tentacles, if you cut one off or whatever, they get other attacks. But they only have 2d6 hit dice, so you're going to kill them pretty quickly. Now, they do have the hilarious once-per-day fart attack, you know, which coats its victims in this foul-smelling, you know, oil that no one wants to get around them. They're poisoned, and people within five feet are poisoned. You know, again, they get a save. But, you know, overall, the flump, if you attack it, it's just more irritating than any kind of threat. But it's exactly this seeming uselessness that I think makes the flump such an instructive monster in terms of the importance of storytelling and storylines in terms of building encounters with your players. Because what you always want to do with the descriptions of the creatures in the monster manual is sort of read between the lines and think about what they imply in terms of you know, the social structure and interaction of the creature with its environment. So I'm going to talk about the two approaches that I use generally uh, in creating storylines for monsters, uh, and which I'm going to apply to the flump in this example. So the first one is to just take the monster as it is in the monster manual, but look at the stats and the description of the monster and think about what this implies for this creature in terms of how it interacts with other members, uh, of its group, and then the greater world, and, and what it, its objectives and goals might be. And the second is using that same information to homebrew the flump, to make some changes, make some a unique flump or a unique creature, but one that makes sense in terms of the description that's given in the book. All right, so we're going to start with number one. We're going to use just the information and stats that are in the book on the flump. So if you look at the note section on the flump, they are described as being highly intelligent with a vast knowledge of religion, philosophy, mathematics, and countless other subjects. So as a GM, I'm like, wait a minute, vast knowledge? That is storytelling gold. So where did they get this vast knowledge? Well, as it turns out, they feed on psionic energy. They need to be near groups of creatures that have psionic powers. You know, they feed on them, they don't really bother these creatures. But again, they have to be cautious when they're around them. Why? Because in the Underdark where they dwell, the vast majority of psionic creatures are evil. You know, Mind Flayers and Aboliths, wholly evil. Or creatures like the Gith Yankee, who are pretty darn evil. You know, you do have the Gith Sarai who are at least neutral, but that's about it. So they've taken in all the evil thoughts of these creatures and the vast storehouse of information in terms of creatures like Mind Flayers, but especially Aboliths, who basically live forever and are described as having perfect memories of everything, not only from themselves, but, you know, they absorb other Aboliths or whatnot. They have a tremendous amount of knowledge. So you got to think, well, what are the implications of, you know, this vast amount of information being held by these seemingly harmless flumps? So, first of all, it makes them highly useful to players to impart information about, you know, long-lost cities, civilizations, temples, you know, the plans of uh, mind flayers or aboliths or whatnot. But it could also make the flump the target for psionic creatures like mind flayers, aboliths, skithyanki, whatever, who don't want their plans to be, you know, bandied about by these weakling flumps. You know, so what if a cloister of flumps stumbled upon some information, some plan by a group of mind flayers that could, you know, impact the stability of the material plane itself. Well, that might be a bit much. So the mind flayers know about the sealed entrance uh, to a pocket dimension, a cursed city by some powerful lich. The mind flayers also know that this lich is still alive somewhere. And if anything happens, not only is this lich going to, you know, attack those who do this, they're going to find out who was it that told someone about this entrance. Again, you can go up or down, scale this information, but what you want to always do is it's information that these creatures do not want these flumps to spread around, and they're out to get them. So now, instead of just floating up harmlessly to the players, this, this cloister of flumps is on the run. Maybe one step ahead of the creatures themselves, a mind flayer or whatever, or their minions. You know, another thing about the descriptions of the flumps is that they seek out good creatures, good-hearted adventurers, with which to disgorge the evil knowledge, the evil psionic energy that they've been forced to accumulate because their food source is, generally speaking, evil. What would be the impact on such 
good creatures, i.e. the player characters, when they see these, you know, horrible, evil thoughts, you know, horrific visions, memories of unspeakable acts. It doesn't just have to be, you know, psychic damage, you know, 2d10 or something. Think about some connection with the background of one of your player characters. You know, an Abolith perfectly remembers the annihilation of an elven settlement by Drow, who then took a bunch of these elves and held them prisoner, you know, and enslaved them down in the Underdark. And in fact, the Abolith knows that descendants of these elves still exist in servitude. You know, and I think, you know, elves in a group or a paladin or something, they might say, you know, this might uh, deserve a little attention here. We've learned this information from the flump, potentially for a reason, potentially just serendipity or whatever, but we're going to investigate this. The other thing you can do is you can relate information the flump has to something in the player character's past. You know, let's say it's a seeming one-shot storyline. They discover the mummy's tomb. Uh, in the barren hills and they notice this mural on the wall depicting some activity and the flumps relate something that they know that's like exactly parallels this but gives a little more information maybe talks about where this activity took place far away from the mummy's tomb or whatever you know it's a connection this is the sort of thing players like because they have the unique knowledge from the mummy's tomb that they discovered and then the flumps knowledge and they're the ones that can make that connection all right, so those are just some things, you know, just taken from the stat. Like, what if you want to homebrew, you want to change the stats of a flump to make them more interesting? So, again, I want to make this alteration logical. I want to look in the book, look at the description, uh, so, that it, so that to the players it isn't just, oh, you just, you know, did this or that. It, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. So, again, it says in the description that flumps are highly intelligent, very wise. And you look at the stat block and they got a 14 intelligence, 14 wisdom. To me, yes, that's certainly better than average intelligence, but, you know, they're going to make a, you know, religion, arcana, history check, and they get a plus two. You know, I would think that there might be flumps, just like with people, like the only humanoids we do, to, to have as an example for stats, that might be highly, highly intelligent for a flump. And then you also have the, you know, fact that the flumps are described as lawful good. Now, as viewers of my channel know, I have never been a fan of the rigid alignment system in D&D uh, because I'm like, alignments are based on the only creature we have, which are humans, and humans come in all different alignments. Sometimes those alignments change depending on the situation. You know, and, and I can understand them tending towards law, certainly, because their society is described as highly complex, uh, they have these cloisters, they don't have leaders, all the flumps just somehow intuitively know their position within the cloister. And this is a sort of vague D&D descriptor that you're like, well, what does that exactly mean? It doesn't really have any parallel. What it means, my friends, is anything you want it to mean. So remember how the flumps have a need to discharge the evil information. They seek out good creatures to get rid of this. It's very, they're very sensitive to this, you know, their colors are changing with all their emotions. What if you had a cloister of flumps that were isolated and they could not ever discharge this information? And then what if this information was so abominable and horrific and evil that it began to change the flumps? Or, you know, what now, again, not necessarily just like evil, let's kill everything we see. I'd be more subtle about this. What if you had a, this cloister and you had one flump with an extremely high intelligence? It begins to be affected by this evil information and it starts to say, you know, why do we have a leaderless society? Because in fact, I, as the fallen angel archetype, my views are much better than everyone else. And in fact, I should be running this cloister. And again, the other flumps in the cloister who have also been corrupted see this highly intelligent flump and begin to follow it. And when there are flumps in the cloister who go, wait a minute, this is not right. We, we, we need to discharge this evil. We need to get rid of it. This, you know, flump A becomes flump alpha A says these are non-believers and they cannibalize their own cloister. They feed on that energy. And now those flumps that went along with it are, you know, they have committed sin, right? The original sin. And now they must go with the alpha flump. So the thing is, now you could have war between the cloisters of flumps, the other cloisters realizing this is a major threat to our, you know, civilization, and they have a battle of the flumps or something. Or if you think about it, perhaps this, you know, this evil cloister 
and I use that term evil because those are game terms, but you know, someone else might say they awakened cloister, they realized the way the world really works or something. But they become allies with, you know, evil psionic creatures. Maybe they align themselves with a mind flayer who gives them, you know, psionic energy, but they work for them. You know, so they could present themselves to the players as the usual flump, good hearted, just floating along and get information to the players give this to the Mind Flayers, or lure the players into the Mind Flayers' grasp. And, you know, you can go a little further. Once you've established a, you know, reasonable storyline as to why, you know, the highly intelligent, you know, Alpha uh, Flump arises and, you know, changes the organization of the Cloister, maybe they begin to realize, hey, I can do multi-attacks with these tentacles. Why am I just doing one at a time? Hey, you know, we can develop through the evil thoughts or something, you know, incredible stink bomb effects, or we all work together in a cloister to create a super fart. Got my super fart joke. Or the mind flayers might give them a sort of modified uh, form of their uh, psionic abilities, you know, a you know mind blast or dominate monster. Now, you know, obviously you want to scale this a little bit. It still is a flump. You know, the mind blast might do 1d8 plus 2 and it stuns for one turn. Right? Or in, instead of a cone, it's just one creature that the flump or the cloister of flumps looks at. Think of these kind of things uh, that add a little, you always scale them, uh, but make them different. So that when they're acting like the friendly, harmless, you know, what is the old saw? Always trust a flump. Well, here's a situation where you don't. And you've got a storyline where it makes sense. So there you go, Joel and my other faithful viewers. Some examples that I have for creating storylines for creatures. Uh, on the one hand, just taking the creature as is, but using the information you get in the stats and descriptions to come up with something, but also to homebrew that monster uh, such that it's scaled appropriately and it makes logical sense in terms of what's written in the book. So uh, again, if you like what you've seen on my channel, please subscribe. I'm always looking for more. Uh, please leave comments. As you know, I always uh, respond to them and I often create videos from them. But most importantly, my friends, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.